welcome to our program today in which we will explore managing vendor performance, what really works. Well, this is Russell Goodman, Editor-in-Chief of Supply Chain Brain, and I thank you for joining us today. You know, demand-side businesses, such as retailers and others, use a number of mechanisms not only to assess vendor performance, but to provide incentives. Now, vendor scorecards, unauthorized deductions, and other vendor incentives are among some of the tools, but here's the question. Here's the important question. What really works? Well, our distinguished panel of experts today represent retailers, vendors, and distributors, and they've discussed their real-life experiences with vendor performance management programs. Then they'll present their cases for what works, what doesn't, and why. During this webinar today, you'll learn what vendor results and behaviors buyers focus on most. You'll learn which buyer feedback and incentive mechanisms work and don't work. You'll learn how a business's supply chain role affects its view of different performance management mechanisms. You'll learn what capabilities a vendor must have in order to successfully challenge a deduction and you'll learn which performance management trends hold the most promise for improving collaboration between buyers and vendors. Today you're going to hear from Andy Anderson, an EDI consultant at BJ's Wholesale Club, Gino Giambetti, Vice President of Logistics and Planning at Randa Luggage, Doug Varga, Senior Manager of IT at Barrett Distribution, and our moderator today is Jim O'Leary, Vice President of Product Strategy at Extol International. Jim's current responsibilities at Extol include product strategy, evangelism, and roadmap planning. All right, Jim, welcome. Thank you, Russell. Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. And as Russell mentioned, we have a special treat with a panel of experts with over 80 years of experience in the subject that we're addressing today, vendor performance management. I will go into a little bit more detail about what we mean by vendor performance management in just a minute. But first, let me quickly introduce the sponsors and panelists for today's event. First of all, Excel International. Excel International is uh, an independent software vendor specializing in business-to-business -business and application integration middleware for companies and industries, including manufacturing, retail, distribution, and logistics. The New England Electronic Commerce Users Group, or NECOM, is a nonprofit organization that serves the interests of professionals engaged in electronic commerce and electronic data interchange. So, we very much appreciate NECOM's sponsorship of this event, and we want to extend a special welcome to NECOM members in attendance. Okay, now let me quickly introduce our panel of experts. Uh, Russell mentioned them briefly in his introduction. Andy Anderson has managed EDI systems for major retail brands, including Reebok, New Balance, and Citizens Bank for over 30 years. He is currently working with BJ's Wholesale Club on several integration projects. Andy was also a contributing member of the National Retail Federation Standards Committee, developing XML standards for digital asset management. Welcome, Andy. Gino Giambetti is Vice President of Planning and Logistics at Randall Luggage. He holds over 41 years of executive management experience in supply chain operations, and Gino oversees the production, purchasing, and inventory departments at Randall Luggage. So welcome to the panel, Gino. And Doug Varga is Senior Manager of IT for Barrett Distribution. He has over 16 years of IT and network management experience for companies within the supply chain. And in his present role, Doug is responsible for managing multiple business systems, ensuring compliance, and enabling integrations internally and with trading partners. Welcome, Doug. Okay, before we get to our first question for the panel, let me take just a minute to provide a basic definition of vendor performance management and outline some of the core activities and measures it encompasses. This diagram shows the main underpinnings of vendor performance management, also known as supplier performance management. And the contract between buyer and vendor at the bottom establishes the foundation for VPM by defining the relationship and setting expectations about product quality and quantity, uh, availability, cost, 
and service levels that govern order response, delivery, payments, returns, warranty service, and other activities. In the middle of the diagram, we see how contract compliance is monitored and measured using metrics and key performance indicators that depend on the nature and value of the contract. And at the top, assessments of vendor performance occur, and then above that, actions are taken to manage performance. Generally, those actions range from simple feedback to incentives, penalties, and formal performance reviews. Now, some vendor performance management strategies work better than others, and what works depends on many factors, and that's what we'll be getting into during our panel discussion. The next slide I'm showing is an important prerequisite for managing VPM, and that is establishing measures and metrics for compliance. And this chart shows just a sample of measures that might belong on a vendor scorecard used by a consumer goods retailer. The measures used for other kinds of vendors, like transportation providers or logistic service providers or industrial machinery vendors in, in a uh, in a large B2B environment would be different. So that brings us to the first question that I, I'd like to put in front of our panel, and that is, what vendor results and behaviors do buyers in your industry focus on managing the most? And Gino, maybe you can kick us off here. What's, what's your take on that? Buyers and sellers obviously ultimately have the same goal in mind, and that is what's always referred to in the, uh, in the logistics industry as the holy grail of the perfect order. But you really have two fundamental elements in the buyer's mind, which might be a little different than the average seller, especially in the, in the retail world of today. There's the practical world of logistics. You know, is an order handled properly? An order is placed on time, it's fulfilled, without any problems, it's delivered on time, 100% correct, no physical issues. And then there's the problem of the product itself. Will it ultimately sell? Which is really what a buyer is, is uh, concerned about, at least in retail. All right, if, if the buyer is an end user themselves in some kind of a, a manufacturing environment, well, the usage of the product is its own, it's its own success. But Probably uh, many of the people online today are, are really in, in working in a uh, manufacturing to retailer or distributor to retailer world, I'm going to assume. And what the buyer is expecting there is often totally different uh, or, or totally beyond the, the, the practical world of logistics. That's a given, I believe, in, in today's, today's world. If you don't perform at that practical uh, fulfillment level, well, it doesn't really matter uh, what what uh, what else goes on there. You know, is a product going to sell in a Target or a Walmart or a, uh, a supermarket or wherever it fundamentally ends up? And is the the proof of the pudding there is is the cash register ringing? Uh, most buyers, I believe, in that environment are are much less concerned with the what I would call the normal logistical things. They just expect the supplier to do those things as a matter of, of rote. And if you don't do them, you're gonna have some kind of pain and some kind of problem. You know, whether a product is successful in the marketplace, that's a different story completely. And that may ultimately color the relationship with the, from the buyer to any seller. You know, that, that kind of behavior and results, again, in terms of practical logistics that has now become a given. You're either there or you're not gonna get the next order. It's as simple as that. There are just too many suppliers uh, out there in this competitive world in most cases who uh, can usually uh, uh, s fulfill uh, the uh, buyer's ultimate needs. So yeah, you know, sellers have very little leverage in today's world. Yeah, that, that's that's an important distinction that you drew, Gino, between the, the sort of practical side of logistics, getting product, the right product to the right place at the right time, et cetera, versus the sales results that the retailer ultimately is looking for. So, um, and a lot of things, of course, can affect sales results, uh, shelf location and promotion, et cetera, et cetera. How much of the of what the vendor is expected to adhere to in terms of compliance criteria affects that retail result. I mean, another way to put this, what might be, um, are there things that the vendor should be thinking about 
uh, asking the retailer for to make sure that they have, uh, you know, a chance at producing the results that the retailer is looking for. I, I think one of the most important things a buyer and seller can do in initial contact and ongoing contact is to make sure that they are both very clear on their own expectations of each other. Obviously, the, the seller wants 100% on-time delivery, on-time fulfillment of quantity, especially if they're a retailer. Obviously, if they've got a 1,000 doors and a 1,000 shelves that need to be filled with a product, a product launch or whatever, the seller should also, in my mind at least, be, be very upfront in a collaborative manner with the buyer and, and make sure that the buyer uh, is able to provide the necessary uh, information to the seller in order to meet those expectations. Uh, you know, if you're working in a manufacturer to, to order mode as opposed to a manufacturer to stock mode in a fulfillment line, you know, that's a different kind of a, a world you're working on. And uh, obviously in the first case, timing is everything. Uh, do, is everyone aware of, of a, what the realities of timing movement are in, in the current logistics world? And, you know, in my case, we, we, we uh, source all of our product in the Far East, all right? So we have this big blue thing called – there's a map on the wall behind my desk. And when my salesmen come into the, uh, into the office to discuss something with me, I always point to that big blue blob on the map and say, you know, that's called the Pacific Ocean. And, you know, China is on one side and we're on the other side. And the first thing you've got to understand is – while we can look at it as one entity, you know, it's a 30-day voyage from one side of it to the other. And getting people to make sure that they understand those very basic kind of things is, is actually still a challenge in, in, in today's world, uh, especially in a world where everything is instantaneous. Uh, I mean, I've had buyers call, my, call our salesmen and, you know, say, oh, we really need this product. Uh, you know, can you deliver it next week? And somebody's got to explain to them, well, yeah, we can deliver it, but we got to make it first, and then we got to move it halfway around the earth. Uh, and some people are actually surprised at that. All right? Yeah. And again, that's because the expectation was never clearly spelled out up front as to what could be done and, and what couldn't be done. Yeah. Let me uh, open this up to uh, Andy and Doug. I mean, Andy, you've worked in retail uh, companies uh, for a, a big part of your career anyway, and Doug, of course, as a distributor, you, you sort of see both sides of this. Um, you know, Gino mentioned the importance of setting clear expectations between buyer and seller. Have you guys ever experienced any situations where that became a, a problem? Uh, this is Andy. Yeah, um, yeah I've had – Issues when I was at uh, Reebok, you know, a lot of our product was produced over in the Pacific uh, Rim as well, and you know we had a number of times when we would have those type of issues that the retailer was looking for a specific uh, model of our sneaker to be in their stores for some sale that they wanted to have or special promotion that they wanted to have tied in with an NBA event going on or something along those lines, but they didn't plan ahead. You know, they would hit us at, uh, you know, September 1st and say, I need 25,000 pairs by, you know, September 15th. And we'd have to try to explain to them that, you know, well, <laughs> that'd be nice, but, you know, we still got to produce them over in China or, you know, Vietnam, whatever the, wherever the particular plant was, and then get it over here. Yeah. I tell, I tell people I'm engaged with that results – are directly tied to preparation. Every five minutes you put in preparation will give you tremendous payback in results farther on down the road. But it does require the nitty gritty work of, of having those detailed conversations. And yeah, you'll always get hit with, with what Andy just described. You know, some, some, somebody wants to run a sale and they just maybe woke up to the fact that uh, you know, the blue pair is selling better than the green pair. Well, okay. You know, everybody will do their best, and sometimes there's ways to get around that. 
and sometimes there aren't. But, but again, it really comes down to that upfront preparation and clear understanding of everybody's expectations as to, to what a supplier can do as well as what the seller can do. Yeah, and it sounds like a very important consideration is that the the initial agreement between buyer and seller basically establishes ground rules. You've got to be ready to accommodate changes and to respond to the needs of the buyer as part of that uh, arrangement. Doug, any comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I just just to further both what Andy and uh, Gina said, uh, you know, planning and, and communication and being very upfront is key because, uh, you know, an even worse dimension to what Andy described where you're trying to get something in on a very tight timeline is, uh, you know, what if the buyer is sort of approaching this from an incomplete standpoint, meaning they're, they're uh, swearing up and down, if you can air freight those pairs of shoes, my, my recent, or my example in this uh, regard is also footwear, uh, not not Reebok, but, um, you know, you, you make all these efforts to accelerate production and air freight the shoes, and lo and behold, it arrives here, and you go to route it, and, and the chain's transportation department refuses to expedite um, you know, so you've sort of got to be, uh, be be sure that you're communicating uh, and, and planning for those sorts of worst-case scenarios with the buyer as well, even outside of what they have control on, on uh, from an open-to-buy perspective and a cutting the PO. Uh, you know, if it's an extraordinary circumstance, are, are we thinking it through all the way uh, to make sure that the effort is going to uh, ultimately pan out? That's, yep. that's a very important point. The the total up up and down the supply chain line of communication becomes in those kinds of things, and even in the just normal deliveries, the most important kind of thing. Uh, buyers in large organizations tend not to be terribly uh, cognizant or aware of that logistical cha uh, channel. There's really three or four channels of, of interaction going on there. There's there's the buy-sell relationship, then there's the logistical people's relationship. The IT people are sitting around the whole thing, and at the bottom of the pile are the financial guys who are going to measure everything and ultimately pay the bills. But everybody's got to know what's going on. That, so the, uh, the, seamless, the seamless flow of information becomes extremely critical uh, uh, in, in that kind of phenomenon. Let's see what the audience said in answer to this question. Uh, what vendor results and behaviors do buyer in your buyers in your industry focus on managing most? Looks like on-time delivery is the winner with 38%, um, and then product quality at 26%, uh, turnaround time and responsiveness at 17, and order fulfillment accuracy at 17. So, uh, and uh, exceptions or number of exceptions or corrective action requests was very low at 2%. That's pretty interesting. So let's move on to discussion question two, which is, which mechanisms are most effective in managing vendor performance and compliance? And um, Gina, let me pick on you again here. Since uh, Randall Luggage deals with both, as you mentioned, uh, offshore manufacturers and large retailers, I suspect you've got a, a couple of different perspectives on this question. So I'm uh, curious what your take on this is. Well, clearly, for us, and I think for many, if not all other suppliers, written communication, clear written expectations, even if it's in just a simple outline form. I mean, you can look at uh, vendor manuals from certain retailers, and, you know, they're, they are akin to the Encyclopedia Britannica, and, you know, you might spend days reading them. And then other people might just give you a simple outline. But the fact of the matter is that if you don't write down what it is you expect both your supplier and your buyer, in, in the case of a middleman, to, uh, to, to do, then, then you're, really, you're really behind the eight ball on everything. We, we do a supply chain manual for our factory suppliers, and obviously we get many supply chain manuals from our from our retail customers. Managing that information is, is tough, all right, especially on the retail side where you're dealing with, you might be dealing with uh, hundreds of customers who have their own little uh, uh, idiosyncrasies about how they want something done. So the control of that information at the practical level of distribution becomes critical. You know, being able to translate what's written down in someone's supply manual into action in your distribution center, uh, that, that's tough. 
and that requires a great deal of uh, IT action to make sure that the people doing things are clearly instructed as to what they have to do. I've never met the distribution guy that doesn't want to do the right thing, all right, as long as you tell them what the right thing is. Well, we, we, we actually have a distribution guy on the line here, so uh, Doug, do uh, you have any response to Gino's thoughts there? Certainly, uh, that, that is uh, the, the, the distribution guy's goal is to do the right thing, and, and, and you're absolutely correct. Um, it's a constant challenge, um, you know, especially with, with larger facilities and in situations like, like ours where we have, uh, you know, uh, in the double-digit number of facilities, how do you convey all those messages uh, out to the floor uh, in the right way so that they're actionable and, you know, you're not overloading anyone and, you know, expecting them to decipher uh, something that, um, you know, just isn't possible for the amount of time they have allotted to, to pick that uh, order, by the way, which also has to be perfect. So we're, you know, we're constantly looking at different technologies, better ways to accumulate that information and, and relay it out to the workforce. But, you know, I, I think in terms of, um, you know, where, where we sit, we definitely participate with suppliers uh, that, uh, you know, take different approaches to this, which, which I'll go into more in a little bit. But, you know, I think clear written communication is important. But it seems the biggest motivator to action that I see is that pocketbook hit, whether it's, go whether it's going to be the, the, the actual deduction or merely the threat of here's what your deduction would have been, you have X days to become compliant. Um, I, I frequently see that as the number one motivator for change uh, with, uh, with suppliers uh, shipping to retailers. You know, it's, it's how to prevent how do, you, how do you still get to the, as close as possible to that order so that you don't have to be, be staring at that chargeback report, you know, every Monday morning or uh, the first of the month, seeing what it was that uh, got messed up in the previous month's business? Yeah, you know, it's interesting, both uh, Gino, both you and Doug mentioned um, uh, clear communications as sort of a, a foundation for um, managing performance and compliance. I'm just wondering what some of the thing common, um, uh, looking at it from the other perspective, what are some of the things that are likely to, to uh, cause trouble with uh, compliance? Um, I'm thinking about even predictable things like lots of purchase order changes, for example. I don't know if that's the best example, but uh, what, what do you see as the biggest challenges to managing performance and compliance? Well, in my case, it's, it's really uh, the, the physical aspect of the movement of goods. I, you know, in, in our industry, luggage is a big, bulky product. Packaging is extremely important in order to minimize transportation costs. So you have to be very clear with your customer and your, and your factory supplier how you want something moved. So you mentioned earlier that big blue um, spot in the middle of the globe, which is the 30 days of time it takes to transport uh, goods across the Pacific. Uh, that must make changes kind of a, a, a challenge for your business, and I don't know how frequently those things occur, but um, what, what, if, what effect does that sort of lag time between um, orders and fulfillment cause for you? Changes are not so much a, a problem on, on the manufacturing side since once you're committed to manufacture, you're committed. <laughs> uh, changes from retailers on the, on the immediate supply side, they will happen. You know, you know, open the buys change. As long as you haven't pulled the order and it's not sitting on an outbound dock, You'll stand on your head to make sure that, that, that what goes out is what the retailer wants. We don't experience a great deal that way. Uh, you know, it depends on the volatility of the consumer marketplace, and, and uh, to see violent changes is, is not a commonplace, uh, at least in my industry. Yep. Andy, Doug, any, any comments on that or on, on, on this question in general, I should say? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I think the, the, the violent change or the, the sudden change for us isn't so much the issue. It's, it's the constant stream of variation. So, you know, we're, we're looking at, uh, you know, several dozen major retailers every day shipping, you know, potentially six to 20 different types of commodities to those retailers from different geographies within the United States. 
so uh, for us, where you know we're, we're constantly not just having to monitor for uh, retailer uh, compliancy changes, but then we have to uh, understand how that impacts all of those various dimensions. And uh, you know, there, there, there's very uh, infrequently a one-size-fits-all uh, answer for us. Uh, so it is a, a continuing challenge to uh, stay on top of those uh, steady stream of changes. Yep. Let's see what the audience is. Uh, response to this question was. So again, the question is, which mechanisms are most effective in managing vendor performance and compliance? Looks like uh, scorecards uh, are the number one answer at 36%, and then periodic vendor performance reviews at 33%, uh, written compliance policies at 26%, and then at the uh, trailing are the, uh, that's interesting, unauthorized deductions and chargebacks at only 3%, and uh, portal or workflow applications at 3 Interesting results, guys. In, any comments on this? No, I think it, I, I, I think it makes sense. I mean, I, I think the unauthorized deduction is sort of that 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 kick in the rear when you need it, and then obviously the other pieces here are, are how to, to truly manage uh, better going forward. So I, I think the uh, scores make sense. Let's remove the results and move on to our next question. All right. So question number three for the panel is what characteristics are most important in determining a business's views on vendor performance management? And Doug, as, as our representative for the distributors on the panel, I, I suspect you see this factors from multiple perspectives, so uh, I'm curious what your take on this is. Yeah, I, I think from where, where I sit uh, here as a, as a 3PL, as, as an intermediary partner, uh, we, we definitely see the entire spectrum. Uh, so we, we see, you know, some retail vendor relationships that are, you know, very true partnerships. And, uh, you know, they're both the buyer and the vendor are, are actively trying to use, you know, whether it be data pushed to them or, or scorecard information that can be pulled on demand. And they're actually trying to use it week over week to improve and strengthen the relationship. And then, you know, you sort of go to the other end of the spectrum where, you know, you, you clearly may, may – uh, get the sense that there are certain retailers uh, that are, you know, strictly using these relationships or the, these compliancy rules uh, as, as a margin builder. And, uh, you know, I, I think the, the, the number one takeaway from our, from our role, uh, you know, servicing so many different sets of suppliers and retailers is there's a lot of variation and, and you know, situations that you may not think intuitively would work for some reason, sometimes do. For instance, if you've got a, a product that's particularly high demand and, and, you know, maybe as a fashion product has a high margin, it's very interesting to sit from our perspective and watch what happens when maybe you, you know that you are not executing this in a way that's fully in line with the retailer requirement. You bring that to the attention of the supplier and the supplier decides that's okay, we're going to do it this way. We, you know, we know we've overpriced it so we can accept the hit. That's, you know, you shake your head at that one, but it, it does happen. And then, you know, you, you to, to the point of, uh, you know, lack of understanding those relationships where um, I've seen suppliers actually doing things like paying the freight going to the retailer. When there's big red X's all around and at a point the transportation group at the receiving retailer even stops the practice, but it takes almost a full season for that to go 360 and for the supplier to realize, ah, okay, I thought I was doing them a favor and, and now I've double done them a favor because I've not only paid the freight, but I now have to accept all these um, uh, uh, chargebacks on top of that. So, um, you know, I, I certainly uh, think that understanding the audience on, on both sides, uh, the, the, the retailer buyer in the relationship, uh, as well as the supplier and, and the type of product and what that looks like is, is very important. Um, you know, from an ideal perspective, we, we prefer to see a customer, a, a supplier who's taking a proactive approach, right? We, we don't want someone who's taking the, the reactionary approach and just kind of sees what's happening. We need someone... Uh, as we like to approach it, where there's an evangelist uh, touting the, the, the value of being proactive and scrutinizing these manuals and putting together the proper uh, action plans and, and procedures and systems to drive it, um, you know, and really taking that to the point, hopefully, of, of dealing with a partner that has a, an internal culture of compliance. Because we definitely, I, I see it going the other way, where the, the attitude is just, 
I don't know why we've done business with X. They are the devil. And if you fight it like that, you're, you're either going to lose because you're going to be kicked off the shelf because you can't get things in to meet the open-to-buy demand, or at the end of the day, you think you're fine, but you're, you're not taking home as much uh, profit as you, you could be if you were uh, making the investment in that, that culture shift. Yeah, interesting. You mentioned the, the good situation is when you come across somebody with somebody who's got some some determination and zeal for ensuring compliance internally. How, how often do you come across that? I mean, is that unusual or is that something that you're you're seeing often? It it it, it has become it, it's becoming more the norm, thankfully. But you know, surprisingly, I, I you know that that twist is almost recent in the terms of past five to ten years. Although these uh, vendor performance management programs have been in place far longer and chargebacks, a lot of the viewpoint of compliancy, especially with smaller suppliers, is that, you know, that, that's above where we're at. We don't need to worry about it, and they just continually ignore it. Or I, I've even been, been privy to conversations within companies where they, they look at an opportunity end-to-end -end and, and just to decide on the path of total avoidance. They, they, you know, they, and that was very prevalent, you know, uh, five, ten years ago. I, I would see this in a lot of footwear and apparel companies that I would interact with where, where they would actually look at it all and say, boy, Amazon's got all these requirements, and they're not going to go anywhere. We're just not going to do business with them. And obviously that, that can backfire quite uh, substantially on a brand as well. Do you see that, that sort of shift in attitude about compliance? Is that something that you think is a reflection of an appreciation for the strategic value of compliance? Or, I mean, in other words, do you see, a, I, I guess this is sort of anticipating some discussions we might have later, but do you see a sort of a shift from unwilling compliance based on deductions and uh, scorecards and things like that to, to a situation where suppliers are sort of taking more responsibility on themselves to um, ensure compliance and be proactive about um, making sure that the right things happen. Absolutely, I, I think we're you know we're, we're making that that shift, and in no small part, you know, due to just the overall improvements in supply chain technology over the years. Where you know, if, if you look back, it maybe it took two, three, four months in the past to get notification from a from a retailer that you were non-compliant, and depending on you know if you're a seasonal business or or you know, depending on the particulars, you might have already basically lost at that point. By, by the time you get notified of the problem, there's absolutely no effective way to address it. Uh, now that many of the retailers are, you know, uh, publishing these, these scorecard uh, uh, data sets in more real time, whether that be weekly or biweekly, um, and you can actually act on it in a way that you could say, okay, well, you know, I, I, I took the hit on these two POs, but I know the next 10 in the pipeline are going to be fine. Um, I, I think that has, uh, you know, not just the technology being there to help people act on that, but just the mental state of, of people feeling like they're being set up to succeed now, when I, when I think in the past it, it, it may not have appeared that way to many suppliers. Yeah. But Andy, a lot of your career has been spent on the retail side. I'm curious whether you see uh, the same thing that Doug sees or, or uh, any, any other comments on that? I see a lot of that going on. Um, although there are still instances where a retailer is not paying their invoice until, you know, three or four months down the road. So that's, you know, they'll do the deduction at that point. You know, so then you're trying to scramble to figure out, wait, wait a minute, why, why are we getting this deduction all of a sudden now? You know, and you have to do the extra research to find out, you know, what shipment are they talking about? You know, it, it just makes it a lot more difficult that way. I mean that's that's sort of a that's sort of a uh, sorry to interrupt, but I, I think you're making an excellent point. One of the sort of keys to managing it, anything is to take action uh, at the right time, right? Right. And I'll go back to what I said earlier: that, that, that preparation and ex and understanding of each other's expectations. You know, a wise retailer puts somebody in charge of supply chain compliance, assuming they can afford it and they're large enough. To do it, you know, uh, something you simply cannot sweep under the rug or, or hope for the best, because you will get massacred on the on the day you're looking for payment on those invoices, and it's just not worth it. Better to to uh, have everyone up front know what the information needs are 
and be able to translate them into physical reality. Will you fail occasionally? Of course you will. Every, you know, nothing is perfect. But at least you'll know what you're, you're, uh, you're doing. And, you, and it's not going to be just a surprise to say, wow, there was $100,000 worth of invoices due in the mailbox this morning, and we got $0 because they're holding everything for X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. That's not a good day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and to, to Gino's point, you know, when I was at uh, both Reebok and Puma, they had groups that that was their whole job was uh, they were the compliance group. So their job was to monitor you know, the compliance documents from the different retailers that we were supplying. And any time there, anytime there were any changes, you know, they had to uh, communicate those to the IT department or the warehouse or whoever was involved in that particular area that was changing. Uh, but they had, you know, a group of three or four people that that was their their sole job was just monitoring all of their event, all of their uh, retailers to see what was changing on from a compliance standpoint. Hmm. And hey, some great um, commercial options out there. I won't name any by name, but you know, I'm sure we've all seen them, and we we do participate in in many of those sorts of groups. Uh, that you subscribe to, and they maintain a more direct relationship with the retailer. We found great value uh, to those organizations and partnerships because it is a lot of information. And you know, in the absence of a team of three or, or someone looking at it, you know, uh, it, it is tough to pick out the right bits all the time. Um, and you know, it's it's almost more discouraging when you see someone trying to stay on top of it by just merely you know emailing out an email with 15 PDFs attached to it to the whole company and saying. Okay, here's the latest, you know, guidelines for uh, Walmart, and, and okay, you know, who's going to look at which PDF when? Unless there's a plan, uh, you know, and somebody driving it, uh, it, it's almost pointless to push it out that way. Yeah, I have a great simple, point. I have a simple solution to that. Whenever send, whenever someone uh, sends me or someone in my groups a large vendor manual, I will always return it and ask them if they've read it. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's a good sign that we need to uh, take a look at what our audience says about this question. So, Gabriel, if you wouldn't mind, please showing us the results of uh, poll number three. Uh, again, the question is, what characteristics are most important in determining businesses' views on vendor performance management? Number one is the strategic value or exclusivity of goods and services. Yeah, no surprise there. And second is supply chain role, whether you're a buyer, vendor, and, or intermediary. Then training partner volume is 15% or value of goods traded, history or experience with the vendor management programs at 13, and then number of trading partner relationships and business relationship longevity at the end. Any comments on those, on this, guys? I'm, I'm very much not surprised with B being the top answer. I've, I've seen these magic wands the buyers pull out and just make you know problems go away on, on product in demand. It, obviously, it makes sense, but definitely – <laughs> Definitely is a driver to how much you're going to be penalized. Let's move on to our fourth discussion question, and that is, what is the most important capability a vendor must have in order to successfully challenge a deduction? And, you know, this, uh, we, we actually, just a note to the audience here, uh, we saw the poll result earlier that, that showed that unauthorized deductions were rated as sort of a, a low, sort of a minor factor in vendor manage, uh, performance management. However, we still hear, at least uh, speaking for Extol, we still hear a number of our customers talk about how they struggle with uh, deductions. And, I, again, I think Gina was right. The wording of that question probably made it unclear what we were really asking. So uh, we do want to just spend a little bit of time here talking about the deductions problem specifically. Let's see. Andy, I think, uh, I think we might toss with this one to you. Uh, what, what's your take on this? The first thing, I think, is to try to avoid having to even deal with challenging chargebacks. And the best way for that is taking the, the time up front before you even start and design and develop a system or, or a group of processes where your data is as correct as can possibly be ahead of time before you even start dealing with, with these type of things. You know, if that's not the case and you're already into it and you're getting these uh, chargebacks, I think uh, a number of different things can come into play. One is you need to make sure you have uh, enough backup capabilities, you know, uh, enough uh, volume of backup. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, we've had times when 
somebody will come down three or four months down the road and just take a deduction on a shipment you know, three or four months earlier. So you need to be able to have that data that you sent out or you transmitted to the retailer at, back at that time available to you so you can access it and uh, hopefully prove that what you sent them was the correct information. You know, that's AS, you know, I'm, talk, I'm talking a lot like ASN at this point. You know, another thing that I've found that's very helpful to, in fighting chargebacks is I've always tried to have an open line of communication with my counterparts at the retailers. Just, you know, reach out to them, talk to them about a bunch of different things, keep in, you know, tell them what system changes are coming down the pike for you, what's, they'll let you know what system changes are coming down for them in the future, you know, if you find out about things ahead of time uh, sooner than they normally would notify their vendors. You know, if you get 30 days notice, you, that's usually pretty good. So and I always would rather find out sooner than that if I'm going to have to make any changes to my systems. And just by having that line of communication open, uh, I've found that you're more likely to they'll be a little more lenient with you if you have some issues, uh, at least in the beginning. If the issues keep repeating, obviously, you're out of luck and you're on your own. But if you have a, a good, good rapport with people at your retailers, most of them are more willing to cut you a little bit of slack. You know, like I said, at least the first time, try and you know, give you a chance to make the correction. If you can explain what the issue was, you know, it's a one-time thing. If you put a fix in place for it, it won't happen again. You know, that they they may uh, maybe not give you the full chargeback reimburse, but you know, at least maybe cut in half or something. As far as you know, other types of issues, training has been chargebacks. Not, and they're not all data issues, so you may get a um, you know chargeback because a label is on the wrong location on a on a uh, box that's shipped out or a pallet that's shipped out. They're going to charge you back on that. Um, you may have the wrong with well, the product that's in the cases may not match what was sent on the ASN or the BOL information that the trucker has may not match what was on the ASN. Most of those issues come down to training with your warehouse people and your data entry people. Uh, so you need to try to make sure you've got enough of the proper training up front to try to avoid those type of issues. Uh, have some type of a QA process set up out in the warehouse so that before products go up, actually get on the truck and ship out, somebody knows that everything has been labeled correctly, uh, information has been uh, put into the system correctly uh, before the, inf the um, transactions are created to send off to the retailer. Yeah, Andy, you, you just made an important distinction, I think, which is that, you know, there are deductions um, that are verifiable through data, and then there are deductions that are not verifiable through data. And an example of the latter would be the, you know, incorrect labeling or wrong product shipped, right, that kind of thing. How do you, yeah. how do you uh, verify the, the, the second case? I'm not sure you really can. Uh, the only, you know, unless you, you know, somehow are, you know, you have a, a camera on your, you know, loading dock and you can zoom in on the packages to prove that the label was in the right spot. You know, may, maybe you can ask the root retailer, you know, prove to me that the label wasn't in the right spot. I don't know how much that well, would fly with the them. retailer can do because they are taking pictures themselves. Yeah. And in, in fact, we, you know, we do that. We, we actually photograph outbound shipments, at least an example of a typical box going out the door so that, uh, you know, we do have some kind of hard data backup for those non-electronic data things. Usually the electronic kind of things are relatively easy to, to, to find the data and see, okay, I did it or I didn't do it, you know, what happened or what didn't happen. It's the physical things that, that become issues and uh, you know we we go as far as actually photographing our upbound shipments interesting okay yeah i think gino i think you're probably uh in the minority with that based on my well, experience i'm sure we are because you know my again i can do it because i have large bulky shipments where i can take an example you know if you're moving uh hundreds of purchase orders across a shipping dock every day obviously you can't do that Right. right, and and in that case, you're you're at the mercy of them providing you with okay, show me what I did wrong, and what are you going to do? Uh, you know, the most 
infuriating kind of chargeback is always the, you know, uh, label won't scan. And, uh, you know, the, the retailer himself is in charge of outbound freight. So, you know, once it leaves your dock, you have no idea what happens to that product. It might get manhandled 19,000 times before it reaches his dock. And, you know, you get a picture and you say, yeah, I can clearly understand that that label won't, won't, uh, won't scan, but that's not how it left my facility. Okay, well, um, I, uh, as moderator, I've not done my job in keeping uh, to the to the clock here. So let me, Gabriel, if you wouldn't mind, please pushing the audience responses to the last poll here. And again, the question is, what's the most important capability a vendor must have in order to successfully challenge a deduction? All of the above at 43%. I guess it's not surprising. This is a multi-part uh, requirement. Um, the number one uh, individual answer was accurate business data, and Andy, you made that point. And then secondly, effective communication with the buyer. I think that's been a common theme throughout this discussion. And then the rest of them came in at uh, lower percentages. So uh, I think that's pretty much as expected. Any com any comments on that, guys? No, well, that's certainly right on. Yep. Okay, and uh, we're just a couple of minutes before the hour. We did have a, uh, a wrap-up discussion plan that really focused on trends going forward. We did talk about the sort of trend of um, moving from from reactive compliance to proactive compliance. Any other thoughts on this one before we uh, hand it back to Russell? Uh, nope. I think just, you know, to, you know, to be proactive, it's kind of like what I was saying just, just before. Um, take the time and effort up front to design and, and develop a process, whether it's software or, uh, you know, a process with your people that are going to, ensure that you, your data or information is as accurate as possible before you even start sending stuff out to your retailers. Right. I'm sorry to, to cut us off, guys, but uh, I think we need to wrap up our discussion. We did have a few questions from the audience, and we will respond directly to you via email if you did submit a question. And I do, before we wrap up here, want to draw your attention to the NECOM Fall Conference. Uh, NECOM, of course, our co-sponsor in this event is having their fall conference in Westboro, Mass. in October. So uh, for details, go to NECOM.org to register for the event and uh, get details about the agenda. So that about wraps up our, uh, our prepared material, and I do want to thank our panelists for bringing a great discussion to this topic, and uh, again, thank the audience for participating. And Russell, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Jim, thank you very much. And I do regret that uh, we are now out of time uh, for today. But uh, to the audience, I just want to reiterate those questions that you sent in. They will be answering offline. Also to the audience, let me just say that I hope you agree that there was some tremendous detail today. And it's all the more useful because that information was drawn from the real life work of our experts. Buyer and sellers both want a perfect order. But if that's going to happen, there are roles and responsibilities of both trading partners and, of course, of their logistics providers. That includes planning. That includes clear expectations, thinking it all the way through. And of course, there's got to be visibility up and down the stream. Absent that, you're going to have what Gino so poetically referred to as some kind of pain or some kind of problem. Well, I'd like to thank our experts again today. We've been hearing from Andy Anderson, BJ's Wholesale Club, Gino Giambetti, Randa Luggage, Doug Varga of Barrett Distribution. And from Extel International, our moderator today was Jim O'Leary. Well, this concludes our presentation. So until next time, this is Russell Goodman of Supply Chain Brain saying so long.